And here we are with John Dyker's Thank internationally you. renowned tenor and Ellie Lichtenstein, artistic director of the Cinnabar Theater in Petaluma. It's such a pleasure to have you both here. Hello. Yeah, nice pleasure. to be here. So there's a bit of a mystery, right? Mm. What are you guys working on right now? <laughs> there's a reason our producer put you both in front of me. And no one will tell me. Well, it's so. a reason unknown to anyone but himself. Okay, okay. Because John and I are not working on anything together at the present time. Obviously, our producer thinks you should be, though. <laughs> so by the end of the segment, I want to make sure that we have a deal in place. Oh, so is that, that we right? <laughs> so we well, I worked with his wife just last year. Does that count? <laughs> That's right. yeah. yeah. Well, let's, let's uh, educate our viewers who don't know you guys what, okay. what you're all about. I know uh, you've been singing this for how long now? It's actually uh, 51 years. My God, and you've been with the Cinderella Theater now 40 years. This 40 is, years, yeah. That's extraordinary. Yeah, we're the junior members. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys have made this commitment to the arts and, and, and the arts as a lifestyle, and, and specifically opera in both your mm -hmm. cases. What, what drew you to opera first, John? What, what? What drew you to opera? What drew you to opera? What do I do in the opera? Well, what drew you to what it? What drew me to opera? Oh, well. <laughs> um, <laughs> When I was seven years old, I grew up in Butte, Montana. Yeah. I was born in Butte. A mining town. A mining town. Yeah. I, I'll, if we have time, I'd like to talk more about that, too. <laughs> but um, uh, my father was a singer, and uh, he uh, had, you know, back then we had vinyl recordings of everything, and he would play the Magic Flute or mm. uh, the Marriage of Figaro or the Barbara Seville or whatever. And I, I remember the first time... I heard that I was having a bath, which was right next door to where he was playing, this, <laughs> and I was singing along with it. And at, that was my first exposure to it. Yeah. Um, I th see. For my generation, it's Bugs Bunny, right? Oh, yeah, well, that's right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But yeah. 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 Um, um, but or Ellie, I should say. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, my my father's family were all singers, right? And uh, so I was around it a lot, and I that's. I kind of ended up as a singer. I started out as a flute player and a piano player. Uh, I took lessons in that, and then my uncle wanted me to be a, um, a, 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 a geologist, uh, <laughs> but but it was chemical analysis of minerals. Mm. So I did that when I was in grade school and high school, uh, experimenting with lots of different things, and it sort of ended up in opera because. That's where I got the most positive feedback. Wow. Mm -hmm. And um, I've, I've thought a lot about that. It's just like, why do I need positive feedback? Well, in some ways, I guess we all do. I don't know. You Not know. me, but, uh, you know. No. Yeah, no. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but um, so, yeah, uh, when I, I yeah. went to college at Oberlin College, and the second year I was there, when I was, uh, I changed majors every semester. I was piano, flute, chemistry. <laughs> then choral conducting, yeah. and then I met my first voice teacher, and then uh, one of the students who was there, who was older than I, said, you are going to be an opera singer. <gasps> really? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think that's sort of how it started. And, and, and what's your origin myth? How did you get drawn into this? How did I get drawn yeah. into it? Well, I... Um, my first career was also as a... Um, mineralogist? Not as a mineralogist, <laughs> no. As a, 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 an instrumentalist, I was a cellist. Oh, wow. And I, when I was 17, I got my first gig in Antwerp, of all places, Belgium. <laughs> I worked for two years with the Antwerp Chamber Orchestra as a cellist. And we hired, they hired a, a soprano to sing some of the Mozart concert arias with us as accompaniment. And you're sort of sawing music. away with envy. I was, <laughs> I was, I was really yeah. And, and I, we went out to, for drinks afterwards. You know, in, in Belgium, you could drink at the age of two, I think, <laughs> in those days. And we were after, and I said to her, I want to do that. I, wh what is that sound? I, want, I had not ever really listened to the classical voice, wow. a trained voice before. And, and she said, well, you know, so, so she came to hear me sing um, Joan Baez music and right. Judy, Judy Collins and jo Joni Mitchell. This was in the early, early 70s, 1971, 70, 1971 probably. And uh, I used to do that in, in the pubs there. Yeah. Made more money as a, as a folk singer <laughs> than I did as a cellist, I will tell you. And she said, you know, you could do it. She thought you had the pipes. Yeah, she, yeah, said, that's she great. said, you know, you need to train, yeah. but y you have the musicianship, and I think you might even have, you know, something there. So I, uh, when I came home, 
in 70, beginning of 73, I think. And where was home at home. that point? Uh, that was in Southern California. Okay, yeah. I found myself a teacher, didn't get very far, came mm. up here to Sonoma County, met Marvin Klebe at Cinnabar Theater, right. went moink. That's great. So, and it, this is really at the inception of Cinnabar, but within a couple of years within, of its launch. Well, they yeah. opened in 72. I came in 70. February of 75, I want you to know. So it's my 40th and a half anniversary. Right. Congratulations. <laughs> I mean, that's a real achievement, a real commitment. I guess Can so. Can we talk a little bit about Marvin? I, you know, I, oh, I'd I, love he's to. He's such a special yeah. guy. I, Actually, we both knew him. Yeah. Um, you knew him before I did. I, I knew him as he was part of the, uh, of the uh, Young Artist Program in, at San Francisco Opera, that's Merrill right. Program. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we did some outreach thing together. I don't remember what it was, mm -hmm. but then and then I heard that shortly thereafter he, he came up yeah. to Petaluma. Did was he? Did he originate here? I didn't know that. No, no, he's from North Dakota. Oh, okay. Actually, <laughs> and yet he came to Petaluma to start to do opera. I yeah, mean, it's well, so there must have been another reason why he came up there. But he came up here because he wanted a better life for his family. Yeah than what he was experiencing and he was living in Oakland and mm -hmm. working with San Francisco. I remember the spring op old spring opera yeah. he was doing that and and doing a lot of touring and, and things and he just got tired of the way of that way of life and how opera was produced in those days, you know, you fly in your, your principles and you do, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, on this cue st stand here, do this right. and open your mouth and sing and he just didn't like that. Yeah. He hated that, and so he came up to the, the, the country, right. basically, and uh, he started looking for a place to, to produce opera the way he would like to do so, and that's why Cinnabar and Theater became in, came into existence. Was it a school before? I mean, architecturally, yes. it's really interesting. It had been a school. Yeah. Okay. He bought it from the Loyal Order of Eagles. <laughs> 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 Probably for yeah. 500 bucks or something? Or? 28,000. Oh, wow. Yeah. For all that property? 500. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. all that property. So an acre and two thirds, I think. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. you, you're reflecting about why Marvin moved here and, and how, he want, how he wanted to do opera. How has opera changed in the, in the Bay Area? And uh, how, how have you guys differentiated your careers within that? Oh, you go. Uh, <laughs> you first. <laughs> well, how has opera changed? Mm -hmm. um, first of all, what is opera? Mm. <laughs> you, know. you want me to tell you or are you going to tell me? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you that opera, opera, okay. means works. Works? <laughs> works? Yeah. Yes. Opus is a work. Oh, that's opera, opera is total works. Yeah. Now, it does not say anything about that there are singers in it. Mm -mm. No. That there are anything. So, in my view, opera, yeah. opera, is a multidisciplinary uh, performance work. That's which fascinating, is, man. Yeah. Which is, uh, it sounds to me like that's where Marvin was coming yeah, from. Yeah, that is where too. Marvin came from, is exactly. I, mm -hmm. I think that um, uh, he was responding, and I did in a similar way to, to uh, the fact that opera was seen and somehow still, in some ways, is seen as people standing, singing, and barking. Yeah. We actually park. have a yeah park and bark is park what we call it <laughs> park and bark <laughs> school of opera. That's it, park and bark. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. But um, um, and it, there are a lot of uh, you know there's a lot of uh, uh, com companies in the country who are still responding to that need or thought need. Right. And but then you'll see other organizations, and one of them that comes to mind is Long Beach Opera, mm -hmm. which is basically. Uh, abandoned the edifice complex, nice. <laughs> which is something that was actually I heard first from Mark Skorka at oh, Opera okay. America said opera companies have to ab abandon the edifice complex. Um, so, like Long Beach, they do things in warehouses, you know, it, on boats, the, it, whatever the pieces are, they do them in a sort of site specific space. Um, but, well, let's that's let, let's come back to that after yeah, yeah. our break here with yeah. uh, John Dykers and Ellie Lichtenstein of the Cinnabar Theater. I'll be right back on 707.
we're back with John Dykers, the world-renowned tenor, and Ellie Lichtenstein, the artistic director of the Cinnabar Theater. Before we broke, we were talking about uh, opera in unconventional unconventional spaces. And right. We were talking about Long Beach and how they perform in warehouses and rail, rail yards, gas stations. Uh, apparently, they did something in a bank lobby. And they did something in a swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> I was just making stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's great. And the Cinnabar Theater is also sort of an unconventional space. Well, you know, in the early 70s, which is, or late 60s, which is when Marvin and his family moved to, to Petaluma yeah. to, to, to make his own space, this was, this was a new idea, but it was also a rampant idea. Interesting, like I theater mean, companies the, everywhere. The theater companies everywhere yeah. were doing all kinds. It was street theater time, you know, guerrilla right. theater. And so the, the Cinnabar Theater San being Francisco an old... San Francisco Mime True. That's right, say, San yeah. Francisco yeah. Mime True. Yeah. I think we were about the same age, in yeah. fact. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the conditions um, were right for this kind of thing. Conditions were perfect yeah. for this kind of thing. And so, so he created a, a space that was, like you say, unconventional at the and time. And it's, it's a destination still. I mean, he made yeah. it a destination. He made it into yeah. a destination. That's how he's, he chose the space. He went all over Sonoma County. and I mean, you could buy a Grange Hall or, a, or a, an old school or an old church for ha -ha, a song. <laughs> <laughs> and he went into these spaces <laughs> and he sang. And he chose Cinnabar because it had the best acoustics. Oh, wow. But it also had room for a parking lot and a place for his family to... to to, to live and grow up in. That's right. I, re I remember now there was a house on the other half still of it. A, still a house. Yeah, His widow still lives there. That's great. Jan, right? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so when you were launching your careers and you ended up at the Cinnabar. I did. Did you think you could do opera? Oh, no. At, not at all. In Petaluma? I oh, mean, I didn't <laughs> know anything about opera at okay. the time. I was a, a, a complete baby. You would have been 20 or something, I, right? <laughs> you want to know how old I am? <laughs> <laughs> I was 21. Wow. I was 21. Hmm. Yeah. Kind of yeah. old enough to vote. Hmm. I was old enough to <laughs> <laughs> choose my own partner. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I came, I, I offered my services as a cellist. And Marvin sa said, sing. And I sang, and I sang something from The Marriage of Figaro, and I sang it in German. Marriage of Figaro was written in Italian, but I knew that uh, Mozart was German, so <laughs> and I didn't know anything. And he said, why'd you sing it in German? And I said, Mozart was German. And he said, no, you don't sing it in Italian. It? But, but he said, yes, I want you to sing. I don't want you to play the cello. And, um, mm. and luckily for all of us, we do everything in English at Cinnabar. Right. Right. And we still do. This was sort of a 70s idea because if you're going to do intimate opera and you're going to do it in a multidisciplinary, multi whatever, you, you, know, you're, you want right. to talk to the people, you want to communicate. And, and you so, want to do yeah. it, yeah, for the people. In, for the in, people, in, in that's language. right. Yeah. It's for the yeah. people, so I didn't have to worry about what language I was singing <laughs> right. in. But that's the opposite of your experience. You've sung uh, opera in every language conceivable, yeah. every language that's been written in, right. including more yeah. contemporary operas all over the world. Yeah. Do you know what you're singing when you're singing it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> um, well, uh, I was I was really good understanding German and French and pretty well Italian. Yeah. Um, Russian. Um, Did they storm the stage after you offended them? <laughs> <laughs> I had to go through and basically, you know, uh, underscore the operative words so I would know what <laughs> that word would be, you know, yeah. when I was talking to you. Um, <laughs> I cannot remember now in Russian any words to say, <laughs> but... Um, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but uh, pretty much, but I guess, uh, one, you know, that's one of the things that's interesting is that, because I've also gone to a lot of operas yeah. in several, many different languages, and I end up, I can't really follow the language. I can't even follow the language, frankly, if it's in English. Because <laughs> oftentimes the performers right. are not uh, articulating. really uh, art yeah. articulating appropriately mm -hmm. and um, underscoring their operative words. You right. know, it's like the word is not operative, but the operative is operative. Well, let me ask <laughs> yeah. you both. How much of this performance is acting versus merely singing? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a complete process, isn't it? Well, it's, it's an integrated process. But it sounds yeah. like some performers... It's all one. But it sounds like some performers will just sing, or recite even, and not, not act. 
I mean, are there uh, perfor upper, upper performers who are better actors than singers or singers than actors? Mm -hmm. When do you, when, when are they perfect like you? Does that happen all the time? Like us. When you're, you're fully when integrated? Perfect, uh, <laughs> we are perfect, I, Sean. <laughs> I don't think I'm perfect. I, yeah? I, no, I don't. I, I feel like, you know, I'm only, will only be perfect when I'm dead. Um, <laughs> I have to, keep, have to keep working at it. Yeah, we have this on record now, by the way. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> No, that's fine. Um, you fell in for a little trap. You've admitted you're not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if, if may I enter? Please. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I I think that the this the whole tenor of this this uh, this interview has to do with the future of opera in a way, and I really truly believe that the future of opera lies in the integration of the multi the disciplines. But, that make up opera. But what, what in that case differentiates opera from opera from a musical, say? Ah, right. Um, because yeah. I think there's a conflation oftentimes in the public's sense of. Well, and that's mm -hmm. a that's a real tricky this, question, actually. I think but this this is something that I think both of us uh, address because mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I have not said yet is that I have a company called First Look Sonoma, yeah. right? And our our mission is basically to generate new work that is multidisciplinary, right. uh, in, in, involves singing, acting, movement, visuals, video, all that mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but it's, uh, is that opera? What is that? Well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, see, that's the thing, because it is an opera in the sense that it is a multidisciplinary work. And using the but definition you made earlier, which I... I'm sorry? In using the definition you shared earlier, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think that one of the issues is uh, how to get audiences away from their uh, desire to see the 12 operas that, yeah. that everybody knows. The same right? 12 every year. Yeah, yeah, it's sort of, and you know, it's interesting because I spoke with a gentleman in Texas last year when I was there, and he, he said, you know, he thought that opera was sort of like uh, a ceremony, mm -hmm. that people that go to opera are going to hear the songs they know and hear it's like going to church mm -hmm. right it's a, and and uh, uh, what what I want to do is I want to want to bring forth excuse me the reality that um, that opera is an, uh, because of its multidisciplinary aspect it has stories to tell we have things to say and I'm really interested in of course of relevant cultural issues so well, this is a fascinating place to, uh, I think, come into our next sec segment. And we'll, I think uh, when we come back with uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, John Dykers and Ellie Lichtenstein, uh, we'll discuss the future of opera, and specifically the future of opera, or this kind of performance, mm. however we're defining it, right. multidisciplinary performances in Sonoma County itself. Because I think that's a special case scenario in some ways. So mm -hmm. we'll be right back. that he'll give us will fit inside our beautiful new room. You don't mean this room? Certainly. And it's a very generous gift from his lordship. You can sleep on your own then. Why so unreasonable? I have reasons enough. Then why can't you tell me what they are? Because I don't want to. Stop bossing me around. I can't believe it. How can you look this gift horse in the mouth when it's the best room in the palace? Because I am Susanna. And you're a blockhead! Flattery will get you nowhere. <laughs> but Susanetta, see if you can find a bedroom which is better. And we're with John Dyker's internationally renowned tenor and Ellie Lichtenstein, internationally renowned <laughs> artistic director and uh, pedal with Cinema Theater. And where we left off, uh, we were talking about the future of uh, multidisciplinary uh, theatrical or live performances, mm -hmm. right? That could be opera, could be musicals. And one thing I want to discuss with you guys, because you're both here in Sonoma County, is like, how does that work manifest here? Are there, is there an audience in Sonoma County? <laughs> do we need to put our arms around the greater Bay Area to bring them all in? Or how do you guys make it work? Because it has been working, right? I mean, 40 years, at least for the Cinnabar, and I, and yeah. I know your company's been around for a while. I mean, that's, that's well, you know. uh, there are two, that's a sort of a two-pronged answer. Yeah. One, one is, we don't have the, the available talent in Sonoma County to fulfill our, our, our missions. Oh, interesting. So we have to pull from, well, basically from the nation. Yeah, to, to, do, to, to get the caliber of performance that you guys are looking for 
Let's well, get people who can do what we're asking them to do, yeah. which is actually quite unusual. For John, it's, it's creating new works. Right. For me, I'd love to be able to create new works. Right now, I, we, don't, we just don't have the funding to do so. Right. But we, we look at the older works, but we also uh, approach it from that multidisciplinary um, platform. And, and, and it's really hard to find people who can fulfill that. See, that's an interesting conundrum. See, I would imagine it would be hard to get an audience sometimes. You're saying it's hard to get the performers. Well, I was going that's, that's, <laughs> that's the, the second part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. the second part. So there's no performers, there's no audience. <laughs> what are you doing? I mean, it's like, <laughs> yeah, right. It's like, <laughs> well, I, I suppose it's just because we believe that the, <laughs> we believe in our work. Yeah. And so we believe that it's important to those people out there who don't know it's important to them. Is that about right? Right, and yeah. I, I, that's what I. That's why I think we we have to do is we have to uh, work on generating new audiences. Mm -hmm. Right, and it's a, it, for me, it's the next generation of of audiences too. Yeah, I would just skip my generation, just go to the next one. We're done. Well, no, <laughs> we, we include your generation. Now, your generation has another generation to go. Yeah. it's the generation we are seeing in our audiences right now. Who the next generation? They won't be here. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> They're the ones <laughs> we're worried about. But I mean, are you trying to cultivate uh, an audience with millennials that that age? I mean, how do you compete with a cell phone? You know, you got an iPhone. How do you? You should just integrate it into the performance. So that. Wait point. a minute. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, well. Well, that's a good that's a good question, but I think you know that that they're not only looking at their cell phones; they are going to see you know they're going to see events, Burning Man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, help me here. Oh. Oh. That's stuff they, that they do. They do <laughs> there's a lot of experiential marketing that they they well, that, participate that, right, in. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, but it, it, do you want that kind of audience that's maybe not engaging the work uh, at the, at the level that your previous audiences may have? Oh, you mean live versus... You re exactly, yeah. I mean, you guys could exist on YouTube almost exclusively. Correct, you correct. Know, but is that what you want? Well, there are a lot of people in our world who are going in that direction. And for me, I mean, maybe I'm an old fogey, but I still believe in that live interaction between the live audience and the live people on stage that yes. you too. Yeah. I do too. Yeah. I, I think that it can also be on YouTube. I think you said YouTube, right? Yeah. yeah. That's but fine. It's a secondary it's good. thing. Yeah. But I think that one thing that we need to, uh, to address is why did people go to opera all over this m m hundreds of years? You know, when, what years was it now, that yeah. they were excited about? Right. Um, was it the story? Was it the beauty of the soprano's voice? Or was it uh, the fact that when people get up there and they sing, or even when they're acting, speaking, speaking, um, they are expressing their vulnerability. And that vulnerability resonates with all of us. So, you know, one of the things that, uh, that voice teachers sometimes say is that in classical singing, right. uh, it's controlled screaming. <laughs> <laughs> and it is in some ways. But you're saying the vitality of a live performance is such that the audience can better empathize with the performer. Correct. I feel for you, I feel you mm -hmm. on stage, I become you. Yeah, I become, yes, right. yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. So it's that, but it's also m putting it in relevant uh, uh, cultural issues. You know, it's right. like the, one of the projects we're working on right now is, is basically has to do with Japanese internment in the Second World War. Interesting. And and the sort of you know one of the th questions that we have is how does that internment specifically that Japanese internment how does that relate to other cultures, like for example, did you know that the Germans were oppressed in the United States mm -hmm. before right, yeah. the Second World right, War? Right, right. You know, and so th there's interesting analogies that are happening yeah. you know, right now, even. Yeah. But yeah, exactly. you want to take what's been a footnote in history and make it a chapter. Mm -hmm. And I think art is a great space to do that. Right. Certainly. Uh, how you manifest that into a multidisciplinary live performance? I mean, that's that's a really interesting aesthetic challenge. Right. But that requires a lot of funding. Yes, it does. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's the next issue I want to bring well, up. Well, it's a very expensive art form. Yeah. Very expensive funding. because it is multidisciplinary. Right. You need to pay your orchestra. And, you know, sometimes, because I, I produce um, straight plays as well. Right. Straight theater, and I produce concerts as well. Right. So, and as well, don't you do some concerts? But there's but, this looming and issue. And yeah. comparatively cheap because... Uh, all I have to do is look at my budget, and my my orchestra doubles my budget right, right there. Right. 
And we have a small orchestra. And, but you, and you do you compensate your, your performers. And, or yes, we and is, is, Yeah, which is amazing that you, you could, anyone could work at all in this <laughs> context, you know. So yeah. it's good. But, um, but where does the money come from? I don't know where you're. Well, he's. You get uh, foundation funding. You get excellent. We have foundation been getting some. F well, we've been getting some funding from foundations, yeah. and mm -hmm. we're now going to a couple of foundations uh, for this uh, piece. that's called "Both Eyes Open" that I just mentioned. Right. Um, but ultimately, you want it to come from the audience, right? Well, well that's, that's, yeah. that's yeah. part of it. It's always we always joke that the, the audience pays for the first act. <laughs> and that's a pretty, it's, it's a pretty decent so, analogy. So you're saying the, 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 the ticket price really is only subsidizes the production? It, it only subsidizes. Oh, wow. It's maybe, what, 30% of the total budget cost? I didn't realize that. 30, 40%, yeah. yeah. And so there's, wow. uh, and I, I know that you're, well, we both are um, relying to some extent at least on donors. Yes, right? um, yes. Individual, individual donors. corporate, sponsors. Uh, yeah. We do events. Yeah. We do culinary events. Just to <laughs> yeah, I, I, it, yeah, we're in the food business. We're supposed <laughs> to be in the art business, but <laughs> but it's yeah. one way of, of feeding our faces. But, but yeah. You say that because we have a we I have a produce farm, yes. and That's right. uh, one of the things I do to help supplement our needs for produ productions that we do is sell produce, mm -hmm. and that money Who goes. Who would have thunk? Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. and actually, the piece that we just did at Main Stage West in, in May called Hand to Mouth. Yes. Yeah, about, about that. <laughs> yeah. oh my, my God. Well, we have to pick this conversation up another time. It's uh, fascinating, but I, I, there's got to be a way to lick the arts funding problem, and we're not going to do it in the next 20 seconds. But Why not? Well, I'm ready. Try. Ready? Go. If you've got the answer. <laughs> yeah, I'll just fix it right now. <laughs> okay, you guys, it's been a real pleasure talking with you, and uh, I, I hope we can do this again. Mm -hmm. Ellie Lichtenstein, Artistic Director of the Cinnabar Theater, and John Dyker is internationally renowned uh, tenor, and uh, one, one stage? Uh, oh, first look. General Director of First Look Sonoma. Thank you. Yes. And at johndikers.com as well. So thank you guys, and we'll we'll talk to you again soon. Oh, and uh, yeah, we'll figure out this arts funding situation. Yeah. Yeah.